The Bible prophesies that following Armageddon, the defeat of the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the return of Jesus Christ to earth, the Lord Jesus Christ will rule from earth for 1,000 years. This is known as the millennial reign of Christ. What's going to happen during those 1,000 years? What are you going to be doing? What is Jesus going to be doing? Are there going to be mortals living among immortal human beings and angels? Find out all that and much more tonight on Thursday Night Theology, which starts now. Greetings, welcome, wherever you are in the world, to Thursday Night Theology. So excited to be here. I am your host, Ryan Peterson, author of Judgment of the Nephilim and the Final Nephilim. We go from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation and studying that, but more on that later. Let's get right to it. Thursday Night Theology is about you. This is a night to explore the mysterious, challenging, strange, or supernatural aspects of the Bible. Lots of things that the church may not talk about, we want to talk about here and answer your questions. So this is a show where I take two to three questions tonight, three questions, and apply my research to um, you know the best of my ability to try and search the scriptures and find the answers to these tough questions that go into the supernatural, Bible prophecy, the Nephilim giants, all those great things. But uh, I'm very excited because I am not alone tonight. So as, as promised, without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce uh, my guest co-host for the night, making his return, triumphant return to Thursday Night Theology. Without further ado, it is the uh, founder and head of the Unlock the Bible Now ministry, host of the Bible Mysteries podcast, Mr. Scott Mitchell. Hey, Ryan, great to be back <laughs> with you, brother. Good to see you. Good to have you back, man. Great to see you. Yeah. Ready for round two? I think so. I think round one was so much fun. We just had to do it again. <laughs> yeah, I had to say, and for those who are, uh, you know, the faithful followers and watchers of Thursday Night Theology, I just want to say, Scott, you know, it was an amazing, amazing reception to uh, your your first appearance on the show. Lots of great feedback. People loved having you uh, on and loved listening to you and all your knowledge. And I think, again, uh, you know, the real reason why I wanted to invite you, you kind of proved it, is that I, I really uh, respect your passion for the scriptures and your willingness to go you know, into these parts of the Bible that we really should explore, right? The Bible tells Amen. us to take on the, the whole counsel of God. And Absolutely. so, um, so yeah, so we're back. So we're back. So get some business out of the way. We have some great questions for the tonight that I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on. And um, of course, as I said, you know, we're going to spend some time talking about your ministry on Life the, Unlock the Bible now, as well as the Bible Mysteries podcast. And, but just to go over the, the first order of business, um, the questions for tonight. So we're going to talk about the millennium, life in the millennium. But the first, we're going to think we're going to go in a different order um, for the questions. And I think, you know, like I always say, the Holy Spirit is really the executive producer of this show. Because as we we're going over the questions and things you've been researching, because I really want to talk about what you've been up to, what you've been looking into. It just all flowed. And I feel like this happens all the time with the questions on the show. God just brings it all together. Yeah. So we're going to start off talking about Christ on the cross, our Savior, when he was crucified, being pierced in his side mm -hmm. and the blood and water that came from his side. And the fact that water came from his side. What does that mean? Is there a greater spiritual significance to that? And um, then we're going to talk about the parable of the tares and the wheat. And I'm really excited for that because just e even talking with you for a few minutes about it, you really got my mind going on the end times <laughs> connection there. So I, I'm, I am hyped for that. And then we're going to finish up with the uh, the question on the millennium, life in the millennium. What will the millennium kingdom be like? What will Christians be up to? What will humans at all be up to? What will, what will the conditions be in the millennium? What does scripture say about that? And I think it's going to really, I think each question is going to really feed into the next one. So I'm, uh, I agree. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited for that. Also, I didn't mention it early enough. But I'm saying it from the beginning. Uh, you know how we do it here on Thursday Night Theology. After our questions, we'll take some time, some overtime for live Q&A. We got great questions this week on YouTube so actually, and Facebook. So there are actually a few questions that I already have written down that we might get to because there are some phenomenal questions this week. Um, lots of good, So we have lots of good questions for weeks to come. Uh, and, of course, there will be 
two live viewers will receive a prize pack tonight um, <clears throat> at the end of the show. So stay tuned for more details on that. And we're doing a like challenge. I didn't mention until later on the show because I had some tech, tech issues last week. We're, good, um, we're doing the like challenge. So for all our replay watchers, here's our like challenge. We want to have 400 likes of this video on any of the channels. You see it there, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, on the YouTube channel, whether wherever you're watching, it has to have 400 likes. You need to make a comment, and two commenters will receive a judgment of the Nephilim prize pack. So that's the, that's that. Those are the conditions: 400 likes. You have to make a comment, obviously, so you can be in the competition. You got to be in it to win it, and then two people win a prize pack. So what will you get? You will get again your copy autographed of Judgment of the Nephilim, the comprehensive biblical study of Genesis 6, the Nephilim giants. Why do we have a flood? How this war weaves all through the Old Testament. You'll get Judgment of the Nephilim, Secrets of the Pre-Flood World, the documentary based on the book, on all the high-level concepts, and um, as well as the study guide. So you can get deep. You know, I made my content for whether you want to enjoy in a night you can watch the documentary if you want to get deep you can you have a study guide that's the companion to the book that goes deeper into the concepts again great for home study group study church study all those things and you'll get a t-shirt a judgment of the nephilim t-shirt i'll show after the break it's it's in it's my wow. it's over in a drawer so you get all that two people will get that um i'm gonna have to leave this early so i can go yeah. comment <laughs> <Leave a comment. laughs> video. Uh, that's, that's on replay that's not for the live comments that's for all the replay watches but if you're watching live and you don't win just hop back in the video afterwards watching our replay and pop a comment in and you will be in it to win it so uh that's it so that's that's the order of business i want to make sure i made that clear from the beginning and uh scott before we get into the questions i just wanted to give a little time for you to i know you shared your testimony but just maybe talk about What's going on with uh, Unlock the Bible, Bible Mysteries podcast, and just kind of what you're up to? Yeah, we've been making a lot of changes, Ryan. Uh, we've uh, Some of you may know that Zena was my co-host from the beginning, the warrior princess. Uh, yeah. We miss her dearly, but she got um, more involved in her training for physical therapy than she had time to commit to the podcast. So uh, she has gone on to bigger and better things, but we've got uh, John Potts, who's a dear brother in Christ. You've met him. Uh, we've, we've come up to interview you once, Ryan, and uh, John has agreed to join our show full time. So he's on board. And with along with John comes his wonderful wife, Jana, who's also extremely knowledgeable. And we're going to tap into her uh, insight as well, uh, along with my wife, Sandy, who's my producer. So uh, Sandy's the real brains behind uh, Unlock the Bible now. She's helping us to get a better presentation. We've, uh, in the last several months, we've uh, released an app, the Unlock the Bible Now app, which is downloadable from any app store. Uh, you have access to the uh, podcast from there, uh, although it's best listened to through a podcast app. But the videos show up there. Uh, the Sunday morning messages I do show up there. We even started posting some old music we used to do. So old gospel songs that we, we did years ago, and we kind of are releasing those a little bit, but just for people to have something that's edifying. And then the, uh, the podcast itself, we released a premium subscription. So uh, Bible mysteries.supercast.com. If you want the uh, extra bonus content, you need to subscribe. It's only six, uh, seven dollars a month. Excuse me, seven dollars a month, and you get uh, everything that you get now, but ad free. Uh, no more listening to me and John whine about you know supporting <laughs> us. <laughs> and then you yeah. get our newsletter. We do a monthly newsletter. We've got a Slack community where we can chat uh, in in real time. And then uh, when we do interviews like with Ryan and other authors, we have oftentimes enough material to do a part two. Uh, and so those part twos are only going to be available through the subscription service. So I encourage everybody to, to be a part of that. If you want to support us taking on the satanic global elite. <laughs> Excellent. And um, I'd be remiss to mention also uh, my personal favorite part of the entire ministry that Scott runs are the topics, you know, everything from exploring the angelic realm to uh, the millennium to, uh, he just did a recent episode on dinosaurs. I listened to on my way to work, a great <laughs> podcast on where do dinosaurs fit in the Bible? Where do they fit in the biblical, in the biblical chronology? Uh, really, really all the cutting edge topics about the supernatural, about scripture, about Bible prophecy. Um, so great, great content that's put out consistently recently celebrated your 100th episode. So congratulations. Yeah. On that. Thank you. And has a great following. So, uh, yeah. And all the links to his ministry, to the podcast, to the app, they're all in the description of this video. So please click subscribe, 
like his material on social media, follow him. Uh, he's doing some great work. And if you don't believe it, you're about to find out. So <laughs> <laughs> without further ado, should we jump into these questions? Let's do it. All right. So question number one here we're going to look at is what was the significance of blood and water coming out of the side of Jesus at the crucifixion? Is there a greater spiritual meaning to this? Yeah, I really, I really think there is. I got a, a question recently from one of my own listeners about this and they tied it into a different passage and I tied it back to this one. So it's amazing that you had this one in your mind too, Ryan, um, <clears throat> because I've read in the past where maybe people that have medical backgrounds try to explain the process of death in a crucifixion and that at some point the heart uh, begins to do something and when they pierce the, 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 I forget what it's called, but there's like, is it a pericardium or something that surrounds yeah, exactly. the heart? Maybe. The heart, exactly. Yes. Is that it? And, and yep. then that somehow the platelets separated from the, uh, whatever the serum is, and that it ended up being blood and water coming out. And that's certainly possible. I mean, I'm not saying that didn't happen or couldn't happen. Uh, but I think there is something more spiritually significant going on there. And, uh, and what I would do is I reference back to uh, 1 John chapter 5. Sure. In, in verse 6, John, in the, the entire chapter, he's talking to uh, the little children that are going to be going through the time of tribulation. You know, the, the, the Jewish believers of that time. And he's warning them that there's going to be some that go out from us. They departed from us. And we'll come back to that. Uh, and there are many antichrists. And he's warning them. It's the last time. That's why you know. So everything is about the fact that Jesus Christ was born in the flesh. He's the son of God, begotten of God. He's, he's making sure that we know that. And because we believe that, that's why we are born of God. And so he goes on to give evidence in verse six. He says, this is he that came by water and blood. And I'm in first John five, verse six. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the father, the word, and the Holy ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. So I thought about that. What is this about the water and the blood, water and the blood. And, um, there's, there's got to be something that he's trying to tell us here that has to do with Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. So um, if we go to John chapter three, the famous passage with Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, uh, he was asking him, uh, well, actually, he didn't even ask him a question. He just said, exactly. nobody can do these miracles <laughs> except he'd be, he come from God <clears throat> and God be with him. But Jesus answered him in verse three, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, so. Now he's going to amplify what that means because Nicodemus thinks, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into the womb a second time, his mother's womb, and be born? And Jesus answered, verily I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, the traditional thinking, I would say, <clears throat> excuse me, the church wants to put water baptism in here. And I would beg to differ on that point simply because if we're talking about entering into the kingdom of God, I know for a fact that Christ said many are going to come down from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. And I know of no record where Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob were ever baptized, right? David right. is said in the book of Ezekiel that he's going to be a prince in Israel forever, uh, almost like a co-regent of some kind in the time that we'll get to the millennium when we talk to that question, you know? yeah. but he's going to be like a co-regent with Christ and that's going to be forever. And I know that he was never baptized that I'm aware of, you know? And then of course the, the, uh, the answer that always uh, questions so many people, the thief on the cross, exactly. you know, the one that believed on him, he said this day we should be with me in paradise. And obviously there'll be a resurrection to follow, but he'll be in the kingdom with the Lord Jesus Christ. Cause he believed on him. So, if he says you must be born of water and of the spirit to enter in the kingdom of God, that would tend to rule out water baptism. Exactly. And I'm not trying to take anything away from water baptism. I'm just not sure I can read it into this passage here. So when he says in verse six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. 
and that which is born of the spirit is spirit, then I think the water is pointing back to the flesh born again from the dead. Jesus Christ, the first begotten, first born from the dead, according to Colossians. So he was born again from the dead, but he was also born of a woman born in the natural way of all human beings. And so to me, the water is testimony to his humanity. He was born, we call it amniotic fluid if you want to, you know, right. but people even say to this day, oh, her water broke, <laughs> right? So it's, it's literally something to me to do with proving that he's very man and very God. Because if he's not man, he can't lay, lay legal claim to the earth, which is ultimately what he's coming back to do when he reigns in the thousand years. You know. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And, uh, and you know, I, I agree. You know, it's, again, it's a concept I, I haven't thought about that much until you and I just really started talking about it for just for a few minutes. But I think it's really fascinating because I do believe and this was something I, re I discussed uh, recently uh, with Derek Gilbert, this mm. idea that the Antichrist, that there's a reason why the Antichrist has to be a Nephilim in that he has to... Uh, be part human to rule over, have full authority over the human realm. That's why he has to be this hybrid half fallen angel, half human to have a, almost a, a right, almost like a legal right to even claim rulership. And so I think that's, again, when you think about Christ and the idea that salvation, it's so important to understand that salvation is not just spiritual, it's physical. Yeah, uh, we are not just being redeemed in spirit; we're being redeemed in body. And so it was, it was essential that Christ take on human flesh and become fully human, to one redeem us and to be our ruler, be our king. And so I, I yeah. really think that. And, and and then of course, when you go back to Genesis chapter six and Genesis chapter three, the original prophecy, right? That again, that what I talk about all the time, going back to judgment of the Nephilim, is that. Genesis 3.15, where God prophesied that the seed of the woman was going to conquer Satan, that this was an earth-shattering proclamation to the angelic realm. We read mm -hmm. it now, thousands of years later, and it seems like no big deal, having the whole biblical history. But at that time, to think that a child, a child was going to defeat the devil, you know, yeah. powerful, if not the, the most powerful of the angels, um, was revolutionary, you know, radical. And so... So again, when you think about the idea of corrupting human genetics, the Nephilim, the rise, the fallen angels in Genesis 6, this idea of, again, removing humanity, destroying or corrupting humanity, again, drives home the point that the whole battle through the Old Testament of the bloodline to preserve, you know, the racial purity the, of the human race, you know, yes. through the flood. It was really about that there is, there is, it was critical to our redemption is totally tied to our humanity and maintaining our humanity. And the devil's plan was to make us something other than human. And I believe it all goes back to God declaring in Genesis one, that we, we as human beings, as the human race are image bearers of God. That, Amen. That, and so therefore the devil's effort that we saw in Genesis six and all the efforts to stop the Messiah was all about really destroying humanity. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, even today, I, I'm starting to realize that some of the current trends and the current things going on are, are further evidence of that human destruction. Because if you think about the transgender agenda today is to sterilize children so they can't procreate from God's commandment. You know, what are we becoming? We're becoming less than human in, in so many instances, you know, it's, it's confusion. And so ultimately human, the human race is going to be sterilized. Maybe there's things contributing to that, even unintentionally, like uh, somebody says the there's um, uh, Xeno estrogens and plastic bottles polluting sure. the water, you know, stuff like that. But, and then you've got the abduction phenomenon that's going on where exactly. certainly something is going on with genetic manipulation creating beings rather than them being born through God's process. I think all that is pointing to something. Precisely, right? The days of Noah, the repetition, yeah. the role of time repeating itself, right? And so, so yes, yeah, so I think it's really interesting, this idea, um, this concept. I, I, think there's, I think it's really, it's, and, and I think when you see in 1 John that says that this, the water and blood bear witness yeah, that's a passage for me that's always been really kind of what does that actually mean that they're bearing witness to something, 
So they're giving yeah. a testimony. And really the Greek, uh, the, when you look at the Greek of that verse, it's, it's really um, almost like a multi-tense verse. So it's saying that, that they are bearing witness, that they're actively. So they're like, it's almost as if eternally Constance, they shall yeah. bear witness that he is human. He is who he says he is. And again, that's why I believe we have all the genealogies in scripture that trace all the way back to Adam to show the lineage was never broken. Right. And so the, the you know, again, God is showing the proof through, I think the water and, and the blood. Well, I, One, I stumbled onto something when I was thinking about that and tying it into what you wrote in your last book, Ryan, about the final Nephilim being this hybrid, hybrid human angelic being. And, uh, and it's interesting because it brings us back to first John again, where we read in chapter five, that uh, it says, this is he, Christ, who came by blood and water, came by. Exactly. So that's like to, he, to he, how he originated into this world of humanity. But, but when, the, when you look at the context, I'll share a couple of quick verses. First John 2, 18 says, little children, it is the last time. And as you've heard, the Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us but they were not of us who went out from them. Well, many antichrists did. All right. So whoever they were, they went out from us um, for, if they'd been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So that tells me that there was some, this is going to bring us back into the tares later on, but maybe that's what he's talking about here. The tares among the wheat. And then in chapter three of first John in verse nine, he says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. Yes. And he cannot sin because he's born of God. His seed remaineth in him. You know, whose seed? And well, you, you do a study of the, the word seed in the Bible. I know you have, but it's just fascinating. <laughs> but, yeah, absolutely. But he goes on to say in verse 10, in this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. What's different between the children of God and the children of the devil? Well, the seed doesn't remain in him. Almost as if, you know, like, a is, is it the mule that is a cross between a horse and a donkey? Exactly. Right. And, and that's one example. But I think they're sterile. They can't reproduce. Wow. A mule cannot beget another mule. You have to get another horse and a donkey together to make a mule. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like he, he can't he has no seed. The mule can't reproduce. So then I got to thinking, OK, what about First John 4, 1, where he says, uh, beloved, uh, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whereby, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone into the world and, uh, hereby know we the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh exactly. is of God. Exactly. What gave witness to him being in the flesh, the water and, and the, the blood. blood. And so then what it amounts to in my mind is this, when, John said they went out from us. Both Second Peter and the book of Jude talk about certain men crept in unawares in the last days, feasting with them in the Feast of Charities. You're familiar with those passages, right? Of course. And, absolutely. And then here's one that caught my attention because I never could quite figure this one out. For uh, Jude, I'm going to go there. I'm going to read it so I don't mess this up <laughs> real quick. Uh, uh, Jude is uh, verse 12. Chapter one is only one, one chapter. He says, these are spots in your Feast of Charity when they feast with you. So pretend like these are false brethren, antichrist, tares among the wheat, whatever you want to call them, feasting with them, with the believers, feeding themselves without fear. And then he says, clouds they are without water. Now, even NASA to fourth graders defines a cloud as water. If you go to their website, what are clouds? A cloud is made of water drops or ice crystals floating in the sky. So how can something be a cloud without water? But then their men carried about with winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, no seed, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, and then wandering stars. <laughs> That's fallen angels. So you can yeah. see in a, in a, to me, He's talking about the Nephilim here. And maybe that's going to tie us back into these tares among the wheat. They, have right, no water. Right. they weren't yeah. born of women. Yeah. And it goes back to, again, Genesis 315, that God <laughs> told the devil, thy seed, right? That the enmity, the war is ultimately going to come down to 
two different seed lines, two different lineages, right? Yeah, the seed man. of the woman, the seed of the serpent. And so that that's so I think I think there's a lot of validity to that. And I think it really it leads again. That's why I said, that, you know, it's amazing how thinking about this concept and how the importance again of Christ's humanity, of him proving that he is fully God, fully man. I believe in quantum superposition yeah. uh, existing at the same time. And his humanity was so critical. To, again to our redemption and to his claim to rule over heaven and earth and so amen, i wanted amen. to share um a couple of things that i saw here so then get your thoughts on them here let me go to this one here so this is from a uh this is actually from a 1786 commentary on this on, on this discussion and it's called the theological works of joseph Priestley. And he said the very circumstantial account that John has given of the blood which issued mm. from the wound in our Savior's side could hardly have any other meaning than to contradict the doctrine of the Gnostics that he had not real flesh and blood. And goes and then goes back to John 19, 34, 35 and quotes the actual passage. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, the side of Christ, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith truth that ye might believe. What could be the meaning of this remarkably strong assertion, but to assure the world that Jesus had real blood like other men? To the yeah. same thing he probably alludes when he mentions the blood by which Christ came, as well as the water in uh, 1 John 5, 6. Amen. That's from 1786. So it's interesting Wow. there because I think, you know, he's talking about again that, this idea of what this, it's a testimony, one that he again, that he's human, that he really came in the flesh. And they, it was contradicting at that time Gnosticism. You know, he's he attributes right. it to Gnosticism, you know, this idea that Christ is a consciousness or an avatar or a spirit and not an actual man, the man Christ Jesus. So, yeah, amen. Again, when you think about this idea of Antichrist and the, and the testing the spirits, this is really something that's being used to really battle for the faith. So, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Because that that's going to be to me. It seems to me that um, it, whoever these are that are feasting with them in the feasts of charity, I think it's going to be part of the strong delusion that's intending to lead away and deceive the very elect if they could, if they could. And uh, it would seem to me that when they appear, uh, they're going to point to something else as the Messiah. They're going to try to convince the world to worship the beast instead of Christ. And the and John is writing right now. The evidence is here. He's flesh and blood. He had he came from blood. He came from water. So when this other entity appears, I don't think he's going to be able to make that claim. There's going to be something missing there. Maybe he has blood, but he didn't come from water. You know, I right. think there could right. be something to that. Maybe he's a test tube Nephilim or something. You never know. Sure. Yeah, hey, listen. I mean, yeah, hey, listen. <laughs> Jesus was conceived through supernatural means, so yeah. You know, why, the anti Jesus could it be as well? So yeah, very yeah. interesting. So one last one last thing I wanted just to throw out there on this one that, that really you got because you got my mind really working with this issue, this question, <laughs> and that's here. This is from Revelation twenty two, right? This is after everything, the end of the Bible now, where Jesus now is giving his final instructions, commands, benediction. Amen. To the world, to the church, and to the world. And notice he says, it says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel. Of course, I'm in 16 and 17 of chapter 22. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And so I thought that right there, uh, again, that when Jesus is declaring who he is, it's very important that he says, I am the offspring. He's affirming that I'm, I was born. I'm the offspring right. of David. I am the prophesied seed. So in again, the lineage. His claim, his claim to being God of all is that he is the offspring of David. He's the root. This is all going back to genetics, to lineage. And then it's interesting that he says, in the spirit and the bride say, come and let him that heareth say, come and let him that is the thirst come and whoso, whomsoever will let him take the water of life freely. And so I just thought, you know, it's such a, you know, it's such a beautiful language that yeah, as yeah. we get to the end of scripture, but there's some powerful doctrine and implications in what Jesus is saying. So, yeah. And, and you bring up that old point about the water of life, taking it freely, which of course, Jesus Christ is the water of life. He said to the woman, 
uh, at the well, you know, if you knew who it was talking to you, you would have asked him even to get a few water and you would never thirst again. And of course, everything ties back into that water. He's he came from water. He's the source of water that brings eternal life. So it, it all ties back into eternal life is only going to be found through believing in him. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And what if, what if what if it's the case that there is, you know, something more to this idea of being born of the water and the spirit or being corrupted? And what if Jesus gave us another warning in a parable that maybe in the end times there will be some human beings who are not entirely human walking around on earth and we don't even know it? Could that be possible? I think it's possible. We'll find out in really question do. number two. And that's next, <laughs> it's question number two coming up. We're going to take a quick break and we'll get right to question number two. This is the account that will take us to the culmination of the battle between Christ and Antichrist. I'm Ryan Peterson, author of The Final Nephilim. Okay, and you just saw the trailer uh, for the Final Nephilim Battle for Heaven and Earth, the documentary. And again, the documentaries I made to be very high level uh, overviews of the book to really get the big concepts. And I think they're great if you're new to this material, if you want to share it to witness or you just want to enjoy the book in a night. Uh, the documentaries are for you and they're also available uh on, in digital as well. They're available at judgmentofthenephilim.com. The links are in the description as well as in digital on demand through vimeo.com. You can find the link to the description for that as well in the description of this video. So uh, let's see, just on to a little bit more business. And, and as a matter of fact, that is going to be our prize pack for tonight for the two live viewers. The live viewers, uh, two live viewers at the end of the show will receive both documentaries. I'll throw them up again here. The Judgment of the Nephilim, Secrets of the Pre-Flood World, and the Final Nephilim, Battle for Heaven and Earth. Your choice, whether you want them in DVD or digital. If you want them in DVD, I will send them to you anywhere in the world free of charge. What do you think about that prize, Scott? Yeah, I'll tell you, I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna have to get those too. I, I keep yep. forgetting to order those. I've got the books and I, I keep going back to reread them. <laughs> so I'm thinking there's got to be more I can glean from this. So I'm going to go get those documentaries. Yeah, and and, uh, and you're working on a book too, right? Why don't you talk? Yeah, about that? I mean, I've been working on a book. I, I've it's called uh, the working title so far still has been the world that was, and it's really focusing on the pre angelic or the pre Adamic world of angels, and uh, and proof for that in the scriptures. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's been a long process to get finished because of the other work we do, you know, and that takes up a lot of our time, but. Um, it's still on the back burner. I'm still adding to it as much as I can. So I hope to get something in, in a draft form by the end of this year. Awesome. And, and I can assure you, uh, there are very few people in the world who write slower than I do. So <laughs> you know, you're, you're right on schedule, man. I, I don't fresh, feel so right bad. <laughs> yeah. It took me a long, long time to write it. So I see a lot of great comments in the chat, and we're going to get to that um, yeah. at overtime. But I'll give it some quick shout out to see Peggy Pauline's here. Uh, Deborah is here as well. Shout out to Deborah in, in Toronto. Jack is here as well. And uh, Gwen from Phoenix. Thank you all and everyone. I hope you're enjoying this time. If I didn't mention it earlier, this is also a great time of fellowship. Let people know where you're from. Share your ideas. Be a blessing to each other. Get in some good, friendly Christian debates. And um, it's a great time of fellowship. In fact, I remember there's one episode where some, there were about two or three people who were actually from the same town who I didn't even know um, who all happened to be in the chat one night. So enjoying that. And uh, let's see here. 
let's get back to business. I think we're going to just jump right now into question number two. Um, let's see here. Okay, let's get to question number two. Is there an end times connection between the parable of the wheat and the tares and the end times? Is there a connection? Is there a greater significance to that parable that connects somehow to the end times? So um, as we start, should we uh, go to the parable? Yeah, I, I think so. Let's let's yeah. read it in Matthew 13. You know, um, Christ didn't start speaking in parables until after he was accused of casting out devils by Beelzebub. And, and then he made that discussion about blasphemy. So when he began speaking in parables, it was to hide the truth from the rejectors, the unbelievers. And it was very much in cryptic form. So clearly the parable was meant to obscure a mystery. And then he would reveal that truth. So the parable itself, uh, most of us know it, but I'll, I'll read it if you want me to. Are you going to put that up? Ryan yep. or um, sure. Okay. Yeah. So um, in Matthew 13, 24, another parable put he forth unto them saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field from whence then have the tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest uh, ye root up, um, you, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And then the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So on first glance, this just looks like, you know, you could be talking about unbelievers versus believers. Well, I mean, unbelievers and believers are all human beings, right? <clears throat> so I'm not sure what the significance of that would be. He, we don't have to guess. He gave us the answer of the, of the, of the tares in the field in verse 37. He answered and he said unto them, he that sowed the good seed is the son of man. So we know that Jesus is the one that sowed the good seed. Right. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. So notice again the connection between seed and children, human beings. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Offspring, children of the wicked one. We know right. the wicked one is the enemy. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. So we're talking about end times and the reapers of the angels. So when you put all this together, as I understand it, a tear looks just like a wheat, uh, a wheat plant until it reaches an age of maturity and then it has no fruit. It doesn't bear any grain. So they're essentially, I think people said it's a vetch or something like that, some kind of a weed. But isn't this a picture of something more like this? Could this be telling us that tares being sowed by the devil are things that look just like human beings? but they're not humans. They can't produce fruit. They have no seed in them, you know, and they're going to be used as a means to convince and deceive humanity to take the mark of the beast. And he says, let them grow till the harvest. Don't take them out. And maybe yeah. this ongoing process of genetic manipulation and whatever is happening, because God's saying, let them grow till the harvest. Just as he allowed false prophets to be in the land of Israel to try them, he's going to allow these things to be there to try the children of the kingdom at the time. So it's a fascinating thought. Very. And the thing that really caught my eye and I'll, I'll throw it back up there is that, you know, I, I, I kind of grew up with the common understanding of this kind of like, you know, the end times judgment of the saved and <clears throat> unsaved, you know, yeah. eventually God's going to just judge everyone as we all know, and the unsaved are going to go to hell and, and uh, the lake of fire and the saved will go into heaven. But, you know, it's really, it's very specific what Jesus is saying that this is talking about the great tribulation. This is yeah. not talking about now, the era where this is talking about the day of the Lord, the final years before the second coming. He says the harvest is the end of the world. Amen. And then the reapers are the angels. And then the Lord repeats it again. He says, therefore, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of this world. And so, again, it's very specific that Jesus is talking about the final years before it's like coming when this world, aeon in Greek, I believe the age that we're living in this time, this time period 
is going to come to an end before the millennial kingdom, the next aeon. And so it's very specific. And so I think when I, you know, talking with you about this, I was like, you know, it's really fascinating that one, there are going to be people who, again, are going to appear like the wheat, but they are actually tares. They are seeds of the devil. And... And we'll get to this a little later, but they also, it also identifies that the, the reapers are the angels, that there are going to be angels who are going to be keep doing the gathering, not yeah. Christ personally. And so that concept really, um, again, brings full circle the idea of, to me, Genesis 6. That you Absolutely. About, this is about, again, this idea of making us something other than image bearers, right? The whole Genesis 6 incursion was changing us into something else. And we see it's up on, it's up here. You see when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they made children to them. Of course, Matthew 24, 37, the Lord tells us, and this is a big theme of the final Nephilim, the scroll of time, what I call quantum repetition, that God is repeating events over and over again. You know, there's it's not even yeah. double prophecies. These, these prophecies are repeating multiple, multiple times um, into their ultimate fulfillment in the end times. And so I think there's some real um, validity to this. And I also agree with you that it connects to the mark of the beast, because I believe the mark of the beast has a distinct genetic component to it. What are your thoughts? I I couldn't agree more that I think that whatever that mark is, is going to change people. You know, I've got an upcoming interview that I did with Timothy Alberino uh, and who wrote the book birthright. And um, in, in a teaser that we put out about it, he makes a statement that, you know, um, God gave the earth to the children of men in the book of Psalms and man did not relinquish his dominion at the fall. He still has it. Otherwise, the, the satanic angels would just come and take us and wipe us out. They got superior technology, <laughs> you know, so why don't they just remove us? But so he makes the point that the only way man can relinquish dominion of the earth is to, is to become something other than human. And boy, it catches your attention when, when you hear him say it, because it's like that, that's what, he, what Ryan's talking about, about mankind relinquishing their humanity. I think genetically we're going to change. Uh, we, those who take the mark, not we, the yeah. better believers are, are not going to yeah. do it. And, mm -hmm. and he even said that when he sends the reapers, the angels, as you mentioned, he's, they're going to gather out of his kingdom, all things that offend. And it's at that point where all of them are cast into the lake of fire. And he even said in Matthew 25, that the fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. So the, the individuals that are going there are going there through, through choice to take the mark and they don't want to accept God as the Lord and Christ as the Lord. They want this hybrid imposter to be their God. Exactly. And I think, and this goes back to, and I'll put it up too. I think it goes to why, again, we see that the prohibition regarding the mark is so strong. The punishment, you know, you take the mark, you are eternally yep. damned. There is no repentance. There is no coming back. And again, I think that's why it's way beyond just being a function of an economic control, which it is, yep. obviously. Nothing can be bought and sold. It's, you know, it's like a chip in your hand, essentially. But I think it's way beyond that. Because one, it's a part of worshiping. It's identification of worshiping the beast. But I think it's also yep. taking on his genetics. And you're saying you're becoming one with him. And again, the devil is just mirroring everything that God does. We right. become one in Christ. The scripture tells us that we will, when we see him, we will be as he is. We are literally taking on his nature. And as, as, and, and to some that might sound astounding, like, how can you say that? But that is exactly what scripture is telling us that we will be That's as true. he is when we see him. And again, this is why I say it's so important to understand that our salvation is physical and genetic in addition to being spiritual. And when you look here, Again, he hears, the, of course, the scripture uh, about uh, Revelation 13 and this idea of, uh, the, the, you know, the mark, of course, the mark of the beast here. And you see this designation of a wheat and tear, right? It says that he calls us all the Antichrist, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. Six groups there, by the way, you know, just which I'm sure is not a coincidence to receive yeah. a mark <laughs> in their right hand or their foreheads. But also we see in Revelation that. At that same time, during the Great Tribulation, Revelation 9, verses 3 to 4, this is at the, the opening of the fifth trumpet when you have the locusts come out of the pit, who I believe are the return, the grotesque, degraded sons of God, the Benai Elohim of Genesis 6 returning. It says, and there came 
out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Again, that's Revelation 9 verses 3 to 4. Yeah. So again, we see God is showing us that it, there's there's two marks. There's his mark of mm -hmm. redemption and salvation he's putting on his believers. And then there's the mark of the beast. So people, there really are going to be wheats and tares where they're going to have, you know, everyone's going to look like hum human beings, but they're going to be radically different and altered, either in the divine righteous way or in the satanic way. I, and I, I, I too believe that satanic alteration is going to be the deception of a promise of eternal life through the mark of the beast, through worshiping him. And, and to, I, as far as I can tell, I think the tares among the wheat are just another uh, parable interpreting Daniel 2, 43. Uh, the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men but shall not cleave unto them. And it's almost like you said, they're not, you know, when Adam would cleave to his wife, they're, they're not going to be done through marriage this time. It's yeah. going to be through some, some other mechanism, which might explain the phenomenon of alien abductions. I don't know. It's another, yeah. another subject we could get into yeah. another time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when you think about it, there will be people walking around who are truly altered and as genetically. Yeah. And I, and I agree completely, of course, um, because of that. And so, and again, I mentioned before the angels. And so I wanted to put this up here. And here we see the warning again that you see that, you know, Jesus references the angels being the reapers. And then you had this angel who goes out traveling the world. It says with a loud voice in verses nine and 10 of Revelation 14, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So again, going back to the parable, what are the reapers doing? Taking the tares, throwing them in the fire. And you have an angel yeah. saying, that's the punishment you're going to receive for taking the mark, for identifying and becoming, I believe, one with the Antichrist, the final Nephilim. I, I agree. I, I really think it's a, it, it when I had to look at it from a different perspective, I was like, wow, I never even considered tares are representative of hybrid human beings that are not truly human. But I, I truly believe that's what he's trying to tell us. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you really blew my mind with this one. So you got me because I never <laughs> thought about it in this context. So you really uh, really, really uh, threw me for a loop. Um, but I think but I think it's a great I think it's a, a really great interpretation. I think it's a much more accurate interpretation because Jesus gives us the specific context. This is a very specific interpretation. It's only talking about the final years, the great tribulation, the day. That's of the right. Lord. Um, it's, it's not really just not the entire the history of principle. the church, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, exactly. Exactly. And so um, one other thing I want to get your thoughts on just a little, little bit more of my uh, some a little more ancient research here. And uh, this is from a, uh, a treatise called The Land Ahead or True Haven in Sight from in 1868 and says this, that scene is descriptive of the, of the judgment of the quick at the commencement of Christ's reign. The tares are the subjects of Antichrist. And though while growing uh, while growing resemble the wheat, yet at the time of the harvest, having taken the mark of the beast, they are easily distinguished and they are put on this on one side for the burning, while the wheat or righteous are taken away at the harvest and come with Christ to behold the burning of the tares and to shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. The burning of the tares as the beginning of the day of the Lord is only an earnest, meaning, you know, for those, you know, I know you're a King James reader, but it means like a deposit, like a down payment of premium yeah, exactly. of that burning at the end of the millennium spoken of by St. Peter, when the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Yep. So what are you, any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's, that's fascinating because, you know, and this is going to lead us into this discussion about the millennial reign too, because I believe we'll be here. And to me, the millennial reign of Christ is not the new heaven and the new earth yet. You know, it's a thousand years before that. It's a taste of it. It's a precursor to it. And it's a final opportunity for man to worship God because Satan is bound for a thousand years, but then he's loosed a little season at the end of that. So I think he's right that he's saying that the burning of the tares at the end of the world, when Christ comes back, 
is not the final burning where the elements melt with fervent heat. That's going to happen in Revelation 20 after Gog and Magog do their final incursion and they encompass the city. And uh, to me, I, I could be wrong, but if he's going to burn up the uh, the earth with a fervent heat at that time and the camp of the saints is surrounded by Gog, Gog and Magog, I think the picture of us surviving that is going to be uh, the, the friends of Daniel in the fiery furnace. You know, Ooh, not even like the smell that. of smoke in their clothes, yeah. not even yeah. a hair of their head was singed. We'll be in there watching all the wicked burn up going, wow, look at that. <laughs> As God creates a new heaven and a new earth. And so. with Jesus, because he's going to be physically there. So right there with us. In the fire. Oh, two and three. Wow. And there was a fourth one there like the son of yeah. God. Yeah. Right? Ooh, that's good. That's good stuff. <laughs> so I like it that. Could be. I like it could that. very well be. That's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah. So, and I, and I when I read that passage too, to, you just proved my point. When I read that passage, I was, I was like, man, I'm like, this is exactly what Scott said. And this guy, you know, this was written 200 <laughs> years ago. So, um, that's how the spirit works, though, right? That, that's it's the amazing. Just studying the word and getting into the details of scripture. So, um, awesome job. You really, uh, you know, it was very eye opening for me. Uh, you got my, my, you really got my, my wheels going with that. With I that. got a long uh, way to go to open some more eyes for you. You've opened so yeah. much for me. It's been like, what a blessing your books have been. Yeah, absolutely. Great. All right. Well, question number two, we're going to get to the millennium and then, uh, get to some overtime questions. We'll take one more break and, um, we'll get right back at it. I think I'm going to just, we'll take a quick, quick break. And um, let me see what I'll play here. I'll just do the uh, study guys trail and we'll get right back to question number three. Okay, you saw there the study guides here. Again, for those who are wondering, if you want to know what the study guides look like, there are lots of different questions. I did all the questions. They're all um, written by me. Um, there's they, Again, they get into the etymology, the concepts, the research that go into these books, both books, the companion study guides for both books. There's sections for prayer, devotion, all sorts of good content. So it's kind of like most of the study guide also kind of journal uh, and faith walk the, as well in there. So, um, and let me put my banners too for our replay. I always forget to put this up, but again, for those who are watching on replay, if you have a question and you're thinking, wow, I want to ask a question. I want Scott Mitchell to come in and answer my question. Well, mm -hmm. type it in the comments on the video, if you're watching on replay and, uh, that's where I get the questions from. And we got lots of great questions. Um, and for, for, like I said, for tonight and for weeks to come. So, um that's what i want i invite you to do that and as a reminder we do have a like challenge so for those who are watching a replay you can still be a winner of a judgment of the nephilim prize pack so put a comment in that's all you got to do like the video put a comment in. let's get it to 400 likes and uh again on facebook on twitter on youtube any venue um and that's it and you can be a winner too and participate and join in the fun so let's see here let's get to question number three as we're rolling, like I said, didn't you see how these kind of all progress? How yeah. it, really, it takes us right through the great tribulation into the millennium. It was just like I said, the Holy Spirit is just at work uh, on this show. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> all right. What will life be like during the millennium? What will we, what will we be doing? What will life be like? What will Christians be up to? And I did put the name, but shout out to Pacific Mile who submitted this question this week. So. Yeah, the millennium, Scott. Take it away. <laughs> you got it. Well, first of all, we we are probably all very familiar with a lot of the passages that characterize the millennium in the in the Old Testament scriptures, such as we know the lamb is going to lay down with the lion. We know they'll beat their swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks. They're not going to learn war anymore. 
they'll be living at peace. Um, a child shall play on the hole of an asp, which is a, a poisonous snake, and that they shall nothing hurt in all his holy mountains. So clearly after the, the devastation of the wrath of God during the seven years of tribulation is going to be a renewal period, a rebuilding period. Um, there's going to be a temple that's built there, according to the book of Ezekiel, not the one that's rebuilt prior to the coming of the Lord. God's not going to keep that one. It's going to be desecrated. It's going to be uh, 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 polluted by the Antichrist. But there's going to be uh, uh, another one built in the book of Ezekiel, and he describes it in great detail. And water comes out from under the altar and heals the Dead Sea. And all these kind of things are happening. That there's trees that grow along the banks of that river, of the water that flows out. And they're going to use the, the leaves for the healing of the nation. Uh, a child shall die at a hundred, it says, mm -hmm. you know, so yes. that uh, mm -hmm. there's still sin and they're still being preached. I, I truly believe the total fulfillment of what we call the Great Commission is going to take place then. When you're going to go there and teach all nations, that's when it's going to be done. Israel, as the priesthood of God, restored and put back into their position as a priesthood, are going to be reaching the Gentile nations that go into the kingdom. Uh, and that may be its final fulfillment. But then ultimately we come back. I believe the rapture of the church takes us out of the wrath and we come back with the Lord. It says in Second uh, Thessalonians chapter one, that when he returns, he should come to be glorified in his saints. And Paul yes. over and over again says, if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. Uh, we're going to have our works judged. So we will receive a crown. I mean, what are we going to be doing with a crown sitting in heaven, just sitting, twiddling our thumbs? You know, <laughs> we're going to come back because when we're when we go to meet the Lord in the clouds, we shall ever be with the Lord. So if he comes back here, we're coming with him. We're going to reign. I suspect we're going to be part of his government. I often wonder if we're not going to be um, much like the parable in Luke about the servants and the talents. And when he says, you were faithful over little, be thou ruler over 10 cities. And maybe, Ryan, you'll get Dallas and I'll get San Antonio. <laughs> <and> <laughs> we'll, <Nice. laughs> we'll be a part of that kingdom. Because ultimately, yeah. in that uh, millennial reign, every year, the nations are required to go up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And yes. uh, I'll throw a thought out to you that I bet you've already thought of before. But it would not surprise me that we're we're the administrators to help make sure that happens each year. And then yeah. at the end of the time, when um, the Lord uh, uh, releases Satan and he attacks the holy city, it wouldn't surprise me if he attacks during the Feast of Tabernacles, because it says the camp of the saints Ooh, is around the city. Oh, I like that. I you know? like that. That's a so really... maybe, maybe there's a timing thing there. Wait, we gotta we gotta pause there. That's real. So, so we're, we're, we gotta unpack that. So what you're saying is, again, just so we can really, really, really build this out, lay this case out. So in Zechariah 14, we see this prophecy here, right? And this is, I'm assuming you agree, this is where you're getting the prophecy that in the millennium, the nations, it says the nations which came against Jerusalem. So this is talking about again after Armageddon, right? Um, the nations who survive Armageddon. After exactly. Christ is victorious, shall go shall even go up from year to year. So annually they have to worship Jesus on the throne of David and attend Amen. the Feast of Tabernacles, lest they be punished. And it says here that rain will be withheld if they don't do it. You know, that will be the punishment that comes upon them. So one, you're saying you believe that the saints, that part of our job will be administering and really overseeing uh the mortal human beings. Right, because those nations that survive Armageddon, those are going to be you're, those are mortals, right? These are yeah. mortal beings who literally survived Armageddon. They're flesh and blood, and and when you and I were talking the other day, you, we, you made a reference to the fact that uh, when when Paul said we shall judge the world, and we should judge angels, that judgment is literally not just we're going to stand there and say, okay, you're guilty. It's active. We're judging. Exactly. We are like God's going to restore the judges like He did with Israel, but in exactly. the whole world, and we'll be yeah. actively involved in that government. So we'll be judging. And whatever it is he equips us to do during that time is going to be basically we'll be the government administrators of his kingdom. Because, there's, cause, cause again, there's going to be, you know, these are mortal human beings. So there, there's going to be sin. There's going to be problems. There are going to be conflicts. And so you're exactly. going to have like, judges all, I believe, all over the world. Right. And all, he keeps referencing the nations. So we'll be spread out as Christians mm. administering God's law. I believe that there will be no 
I, I don't believe there'll be any mortal judges at all. I believe it would be only immortal. It, it, it will yeah. be the immortal, the, the glorified church actually administering God's law on the planet. It's the um, only way the justice could be righteous because a human couldn't be just. You know, exactly. I mean, when you look at our courts today, <laughs> you know, they're <laughs> mockery. I mean, the, God is the only righteous judge. So only his only when he gives us his righteousness, could we be equipped to judge exactly. and these glorified bodies, you know? Exactly. But you raised a good point. That's why I had to stop you because this is good. <laughs> so I want people to know this is this is some fire right here. So what you're saying <laughs> is you might be again, let's just say you and I are in America, in Texas. We would still be going to Jerusalem annually for the Feast of Tabernacles, presumably with the people we rule over and judge. Perhaps, yeah, to, being to like caravans. We will be, everyone has to come to worship. And so that you think is going to be the time that Satan will attack when he's loosed because he has everyone at the holy city right where he We're wants. We're sitting to. ducks, Woo! right? This, so this when you good. think about it, when you think about it, he's loosed a little season. What perfect time to make one final assault at all the people of God? Because obviously the people that don't believe wouldn't go. They're not going to be and there. So yeah. They're not going to be there. And then and they've been tired of having rain and God's plague upon them. So Satan has loosed a little season and all the ones that stayed home. He says, hey, you want to stop this? Join me. They form an army. They surround the camp of the saints. If it's the Feast of Tabernacles, it's the perfect time for God to separate the chaff from the wheat, so to speak. Yeah. And then he attacks and he burns them up with fire. And I think that's where we might just be standing there in the flames watching them burn up as God protects us providentially as he did Daniel's friends. Yeah. And as you see here, you know, it's three verses here, but there's a lot that happens, you know, and I did an episode a few earlier in the year called Satan's final strike talking about this exact passage that hmm. this is a long time. This isn't just Satan gets released and just runs to Jerusalem. <clears throat> He's gathering nations. He goes out first. He goes out to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth. And then yep. Gog and Magog, the, you know, this, I believe these spiritual beings are going to lead the fight in this coalition to gather them together to battle. So this takes time. And so I think you're right that it, Satan's, and like you said, Zechariah 14 already tells us, it gives us the preview prophetically that some nations aren't going to come to the Feast of Tabernacles. Yep. Even, I, I, and, I, and I believe that's even before the devil is loosed, you're already going to have nations who, who are not <clears throat> following God um, entirely. And so yep. they're obviously going to be easy pickings to recruit. And then it says they went upon the breath of the earth. So there again, this is this is really a long movement and recruiting effort to get people aligned against God one final time. And I think it's amazing what you're saying that they compass the camp of the saints, the beloved city. That again, if it's the Feast of Tabernacles, all the saints are going to be there. And in, so it's really in their tents. Uh, yeah. yeah, in the tents, in the camp. And and you know, if we've not, uh, we have no weapons. So, like I said, we're right. sitting ducks. Uh, yeah. And then it would be easy for him <clears throat> as the deceiver, Gog and Magog, to have them beat their swords back into or share, plowshares back into swords to attack the camp. And then exactly. uh, you know, we've never had to learn war. We've been at peace all this time. So here we are praising God in Jerusalem, you know, in the outskirts, whatever. And then he surrounds us. And that's when and God the has city, to divinely. The city won't even have walls, right? Yeah, to, exactly. Eight, which I believe is describing the, the second God may God confrontation, which is Revelation 20. It says it's a city without walls, no gar no yeah. bars, no gates, no fences. So it's going to be defenseless, but of yeah. course not defenseless. That's right. <laughs> because we'll have them. And again, the creator the of heaven and earth protecting tares, us. The tares are going into the fire. So that's, yeah. that's a really, uh, that's an excellent, excellent, uh, Really, that's a, I've never heard that position before. So uh, I, I think that's, yeah, it's I just think a thought. Really Could, interesting. It would, yeah, it would seem like in the devil's character to want to attack at the time when God's people were gathered together to give Him all praise and glory. Absolutely, and, and it's also biblical in the sense that every key event in the conflict between directly between Christ and Satan really took place on feast days, you know, oh, the crucifixion, wow. the resurrection, right? right? So. Yeah. Hanukkah. So it's always, you know, I, I believe yeah. even even to in the, in their end times in the day of the Lord, it's going to be the fall, the fall feast, you know, going right to the day of atonement. So being yeah. Armageddon, yeah. the last day, the defeat of Antichrist. So, yeah, so it just follows the pattern. And oh, if you think does. about tabernacles is after that. Right. So it, it all makes sense. So, oh, oh, oh good stuff. That's good. Yeah, that cool. Good. Yeah, that's good. 
Listen, you viewers, I hope you're enjoying this because this is this is. I uh, love it. I'm enjoy- well. Either way, I am. I'm enjoying. <laughs> this is what I live for, man. I'm this enjoying, is. I I'm love enjoying. it. I'm having a great time. <laughs> I'm having a great time. So, um, great. So, anything else you want to share in the millennium, and you want to just jump into overtime? It's up to you. You have the floor. You know that that's an overview. There's so much we could obviously go over many many passages of scripture, but I I truly believe that we're here. We're serving the Lord during that time, and it's it's just a taste of what's to come. And then, and I, like I said, I, I truly think that the, the real culmination of the Great Commission takes place during that time. Israel is literally preaching to the nations, exactly. repent, be baptized, and, and to join and believe on Jesus Christ. And some of them aren't going to do it. And I think that may have something to do with why sacrifices are having to continually to be made during that time, because those that don't accept Christ are going to have to bring a blood sacrifice because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. So there that's will be sacrifices yeah. going well, on. There will definitely be Christ. sacrifices in the millennial mm-hmm. temple. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, that's yeah. uh, definitely clearly established in scripture. So uh, great stuff. Great, great stuff. So uh, cool. love it. Love well, yeah, it. let's go ahead and take the other, uh, other questions time. if you want. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Overtime. So um, let's see. All right. If there's anything you see in the chat you want to you want to answer, just you know how we do it. You can just just throw something out there, and I'll see what I can find as well. There was one that passed by a little while ago, and I wanted to make sure we addressed it because it was a concern about the rapture. Um, yeah, the well, parable of the uh, the weeds convinced me that there is no pre-tribulation rapture of the church. It contradicts Jesus' clear language. See, I would disagree with that. Uh, with all due respect, I think the parable of the tares among the wheat is not at all saying that there's not a pre-tribulation rapture. I, I think what we have to distinguish is the is the the two folds. You know, Jesus said, there are other sheep I have that are not of this fold. And I believe there's an Israel of God that is that church that Jesus began with the 12. And then there is the rest of um, the dispensation of grace, if you want to call it that, where we are the body of Christ, but delivered from the wrath to come. God is purposefully waiting for the nation Israel to make their confession and acknowledge their offense, according to Hosea 15. And when he does, that's when I think that first battle of Gog and Magog is going to take place and he's going to deal with them again. So it's a separate group of people after the rapture that goes through tribulation. It is called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's Israel's testing, not your testing. So we're delivered from the wrath to come, but Israel will be the enduring the fiery trial of their faith. And it's important to make that distinction because there are tribulation saints and then there are saints that are delivered from the wrath to come. Exactly. And, you know, we looked at Zechariah 14, which discusses the millennium and Zechariah 12, 13, 14 are specifically focused on Israel in the day of the Lord. It's really taking you right to the millennium. It's all focused on Israel and Israel's reconciliation and Amen. redemption and testing because not all of them are going to be saved. So, um, yeah, I, yeah, I agree completely. I, yeah, I agree completely. And, and, and I, I think what that. confused that uh, is the replacement theology type teaching that has the sure. church replacing Israel. We didn't replace Israel. Israel no. was temporarily set aside. God focused on the Gentiles through Paul. And then we're going to be the branches that are cut off in Romans 11. And the natural branches are going to be grabbed back in. He's going to deal with them as a nation again. And all Israel shall be saved as it is written. And God does not break his promises. He's going to fulfill them. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. uh, I have a question here I found here. So Ingrid uh, asked, are we uh, the army, I I presume the church, are we the army that comes back on white horses with Yahweh? Boy, wouldn't that be cool? (laughs) (laughs) Except I have to say to myself, you know, if, if I was the Lord and I was looking for army soldiers to fill up my army and I'm looking at Michael and I'm looking at these angels. And then you look at me, <laughs> I, I'm going to be the last guy picked on the team, you know, <laughs> but no, I, I, it's very possible that we will be with him returning because I don't know that we'll have to do any fighting. He's going to slay the, the, the enemy with the sword of his mouth, you know, 
Yeah. And it yeah. says his vesture is dipped in blood. The, the rest of the armies come behind him are in robes white and clean, fine linen, white and clean in Revelation 19. So we may very well be the army, but I don't know how much fighting we even need to do. I think the Lord's got it under control. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and Jude, I believe that prophecy, the Lord, you know, cometh back when it says executed judgment with 10,000, cometh 10,000s of his saints. I believe that is us. Amen. And he made the excellent point that our clothes are clean. He's bloody yep. battling, I believe, coming from Edom. Basra. His, yeah, from Basra. <laughs> that's right. Uh, you know, fighting the forces of Antichrist and wiping them out. But think also that it's, it's telling us in this distinction between the clothing, it's again this dynamic repetition of the wars for the land of Canaan, mm -hmm. where God is instructing Israel's armies to go in and defeat the Nephilim led nations in Canaan, these seven nations um, that were led by the Nephilim who dominated the promised land. But whenever this came time for the battle, it was really Jesus going before them. They weren't doing much Amen. fighting. There was the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ fighting the battle for them. So I think it'll be exactly the same thing. It's just another repetition. This is what God does. He gives us the preview and the foreshadow. Why? Amen. To prove that he is God. He is outside of time and therefore he can tell us the end from the beginning. And so, that's uh, right. yeah, so I, I agree God, completely. Man. All right. Let's see. Michael Sanders said, when do you expect the final Nephilim to be available on Audible? Well, it's done. <laughs> it is recorded. It is recorded. It is now in post-production. I have finished it. I'm done. It has a, uh, it has bonus commentary you only get on the audiobook, so it should be done, I'd say, in about a week or two. It'll be available on Audible, so stay tuned for announcements on that. Okay. Let's see. You know, we had, if you don't have anything, I, I have a, a question that was written during the week. I have a couple that I wanted to bounce off of you that I think are more kind of rapid fire questions. Mm -hmm. so if, you, if you find something in the meantime, let me know about, I'll throw a rapid fire question at you. Um, okay. And and I do see one in your chat form here real quick. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Easy, yeah, go ahead. It's an easy one. If only eight were found righteous uh, to enter the ark. And I think we're talking about the flood of Noah. Were there not children that were alive right before the flood? Well, uh, if, if we go back and read the, the scripture in Genesis 6, it says that all flesh had corrupted his way and only Noah was perfect in his generation. So if there were any children that were alive that didn't get on the earth, they would have been corrupted flesh and they were destroyed just as God destroyed the infants of the Nephilim in the land of Canaan or the Rephaim in the land of Canaan uh, because they were tainted. They had um, they had altered genetics. Exactly. I think animals too. That's the reason why I say certain animals because I think the animals yeah. were being manipulated too. Yeah, absolutely. And he said, bring on the only animals at their, their own kind, which I think is yeah. again a yeah. genetic term. Like bring on the animals that I originally created, not exactly the hybrid monstrosities that were created by the fallen. Like animals. the minotaurs and the centaurs. Exactly. And <laughs> exactly. All right. Let's see. I'm gonna take a couple more. So here's a here's a rapid fire question. I think you can you can handle. This is from Gary Steckley. Will the Antichrist be an individual, a person? So many of my friends and family feel that the Antichrist is simply a means of describing an organization or group of people whose philosophy is counter to Christ's teaching. Yeah, that's an easy one. He's a person and his he is the number of a man. His number is the number of a man. So he's going to be uh, looked to be like a human being. Uh, but he is a person. He's called the man of sin. He's called the son of perdition. He's called the seed of the serpent. He's called that wicked. Uh, I mean, there's there's everything in the Bible points to him being a personage and a person, not a, an organization. He has an organization. Yes. Uh, you know, and many of them, his uh, Satan operates through his human proxies, just like God operates through his church. But um, but no, he is an individual and he will declare himself to be God when he, when the time is ready for him to be revealed. Amen. I, I absolutely agree. Um, okay, let's see here. Oh, you ready for a little uh, controversial question here? Sure. <laughs> so this is from Faith First. Question, will women be priests and rulers too in the millennium? Yeah, I'm that's a great. I'm, I'm presuming in the millennium. It says two, but I'm assuming they mean in the millennium. She means yeah. in the millennium. 
I don't know if a woman could be a priest through the scriptures showing it was always going to be the sons of Aaron and, and things like that. Um, and, and then in the, in the millennium, it's going to be just the tribe of Zadok, I think, uh, because of some things that went down in the past, yep. but judges, there were women judges like Deborah. Exactly. So exactly. I believe that, yeah, the, our, our crown, we're receiving crowns for a reason. You know, both men and women, we receive crowns because of the work we do. But it's not just to wear and walk around and say, hey, look at my crown. <laughs> a crown is representative of authority and reign. We're going to reign with him. So I, I think when you said the thing about judges, Ryan, the other night, that just clicked in my head. Oh, we're, we're wearing crowns because we're judging through the millennial reign. We're administering his government through that reign. And therefore, um, I don't know about a priesthood. I think a priesthood is only male. But judges, absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think you hit the nail on the head that there they are female judges, just, just as there are female prophetesses, right? That mm -hmm. you have, or female prophets or a prophetess, right? So, and clearly in the end times, God says that women will prophesy, right? Not just yeah, men, yeah. men and women will prophesy. And I believe in judges, just like Deborah, that can be in that in that role. So, absolutely. Uh, excellent answer. I agree completely. Uh, shout out to Josh Monday. From the Josh Monday podcast, he's in the room. He said, what's up? What's up? I had, had a great interview uh, on the Josh Monday podcast. So I appreciate uh, you you stopping by. Um, I need to reach out to Josh Monday and have him on yeah, my show. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Connection. So, um, let's see. We got one other question. Maybe we can do maybe one more. Um, this is an interesting question. And it kind of ties in with what we're talking about. Um, so, it kind mm -hmm. of with it. so this is from Anastasia. It says, do you think... Uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 31, God said he will provoke Israel to jealousy. Uh, do you think by the rapture, won't that provoke Israel to jealousy? The rapture. You know, yeah. that's a great question. You know, Paul said that uh, the, the, the salvation of Gentiles was to provoke Israel to jealousy in Romans 11. You know, so uh, it, it could be. I, I'm not so sure. In my mind, though, that the rapture, we think of the rapture is going to be this event that happens and everyone in the world is going to see us disappear. And Israel as a nation is going to see us disappear and go, oh, I'm jealous. They got to go. You know, I'm not so sure it's going to happen like that. Uh, maybe through movies and books and things like that, we come to this idea that suddenly hundreds of millions of people are going to disappear. What if it's not like that at all? What if, you know, there, there's relatively few of us if we're in this Laodicean age of the church and we're, we're failing, we're lukewarm and he's ready to spew us out of our mouth. What if we go out with a whimper rather than a bang? And, uh, and what if the rapture takes place and it's small enough of a number to where either it's barely noticed or it's explained away by the deception that follows right behind it? with something to do with alien phenomenon or we, they had to get us out of the way because the great change is about to take place and whatever. I, I think it's not going to be understood to be the rapture when it happens. I think it's going to be a deception to the world that doesn't believe. Yeah. So I have, I have a um, slightly different take. So I agree with everything you just said. And I think that mm -hmm. will be the case for the unsaved deceived people, masses in the world. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. do think that's, if there is a time for the alien UFO scenario, that is it at the yeah. rapture. So yeah, they had to be removed because we're entering a new era. And, um, right. but I think, I believe for the believing remnant, those who, those of Israel who come to save, I believe it will uh, provoke them to jealousy. Cool. And, and I, and I think that I actually think there's a foreshadow of that in scripture. Oh, sure. Yeah. With uh, the rapture of Elijah, you know, you oh. have Elijah and Elisha. And of course, Elijah is going to the Jordan River to be rapture. I believe there's a supernatural portal, as I've mentioned in many episodes right. of Third Night Theology. That's where he goes. And he asked Elisha, what do you want from me? He says, I want a double portion, double portion. of yeah. your spirit. And Elijah says, if you see me depart, then you shall receive it. So Elisha had to actually witness Elijah being taken up to heaven, not dying. Interesting. Raptured to heaven. And what comes down, a double portion of the spirit. At the rapture, the church is taking taken up to heaven. And what does God yeah. pour down? A double portion of his spirit on Israel, the spirit of grace wow. and reconciliation. God says he's going to give them double. They're going to, so they're going to receive a double portion of the spirit to, of course, awaken them to recognize Yeshua as Messiah. So I believe that's a, again, what I call the quantum repetition, that this is a foreshadow, a preview 
of the church going up, the spirit coming down on Israel. And even you know, with that, you see Elisha plowing with 12 oxen. You know, again, yeah. it's like there's 12 tribes. So, well, you, you've just given me some great thing to think about because I was, I, you know, I always forget that there's a big change that's going to take place with Israel at the time of the rapture. And, you know, sometimes I, I have to factor that in. And you just made me realize that. So in the time of the seven years, there's 144,000 sealed servants that are uniquely qualified to preach to Israel. Yes. Because we've been preaching a message of grace that's not directed at a nation, but to all men. When we leave, they're specifically be reaching a nation again, as they did in the beginning. Signs and wonders. Moses and Elijah are there. And he comes back, of course, one of the two witnesses. So, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And and something I'm going to throw out to you that we once briefly mentioned when we were together um, in Dallas, Ryan. But um, and I haven't done more thought on this, but I wonder if you have. Do you think there's anything tying the 144,000 possibly to when John the Baptist said, God is able of these stones to raise up children. Yeah. Oh. Abraham. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. And that was he was really talking good. about the 12 stones the in the River stones. Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> that's really, I think there could be something there. Yeah. They can definitely, that's a good one. That's a good I, one. I never <laughs> delved back into it again, but I need to dig into that. Cause Ooh. now that you told me that story about Elijah and Elisha, I'm like, Oh, that opens up a whole other <laughs> a world to that. So yeah, we I, would, I have to agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. We, 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 we've covered about, two or three book topics in this episode right? in, the last, <laughs> no. in the last five minutes. <laughs> we got a lot of books to write. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really good. That is good stuff. That is good stuff. All right. Well, I don't want to keep you any longer. I appreciate your time and uh, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, first, we're going to pick our winners, of course. And oh, yeah. um, let's see who we have here. Our first winner of the night. And again, you're going to win both of these documentaries, uh, Judgment of the Nephilim, Secret to the Pre-Flood World, and uh, the final Nephilim battle for heaven and earth um, is, I, I believe I'm reading this correctly, Zed Busy. <laughs> um, so I believe that's the name. So Zed Busy, you are the winner. Congratulations. So if you're still on, please contact me, DM me, contact me through any of my social media, send me your information, and you have won. Awesome. Okay. Let's see here. And our second winner is... Miss G Delight. Some very cool um, handles tonight. All <laughs> right. busy. I Ms. Love G it. Delight. <laughs> Ms. G Delight, you are our second winner. So uh, again, congrats. And um, just reach out to me if you want DVDs. I'll mail them to you anywhere in the world. If you'd like them digital on demand, you will receive it digitally. And you'll get uh, free copies of both documentaries to enjoy. And as a reminder, again, we have our like challenge. If you didn't win, like the video, make a comment in the replay section, not in the live chat. And uh, next Thursday, I will pick two winners. If any any video on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter reaches 400 likes, you will get a full uh, judgment of the Nephilim prize bag. Let me grab the shirt real quick. So let me see here. And now I got it here. You get the you you will get the shirt as well. We got it right here. Ooh, the sweet. Of the shirt. Yes. So. And I might, be, I might be bringing them back in the store as well. So uh, congrats to our winners. And uh, before we go, Scott, is there anything you want to say to the audience at all? Uh, just to let them know that if they want to learn anything more about our ministry here, it's simply utbnow.com. Easy to remember. I think, Ryan, you're going to have links up anyway. But um, you can find anything about our podcast, about our Sunday messages, about um, our social media, just all of it right there. We, we're we on Rumble, YouTube, um, uh, Truth Social now. Truth Social. We actually, <laughs> yeah, we actually got on Trump's uh, channel there and, and Instagram and Facebook. So we're trying to reach out to as many people as we can. We're, we're at 95,000 unique listeners. That's amazing. Uh, for the, the podcast. So, yeah. that, is, that is amazing. And so, yeah, we just appreciate you guys. If you uh, if you like what you hear, share it with a friend. And uh, just Brian, thank you so much for having me on. It's, it's Absolutely. Such a this is great, my man. Love having you on. I'll definitely uh, have you on again. I'm going to connect you also with Josh Monday. Uh, thanks yeah, everyone please. for watching. Yeah, oh, of course, of course. For more information, again, Scott, the links is on the screen, but also everything's on there. His app, his podcast, it's all in the description of the video. Please like, subscribe to his channel. 
My information is there. If you want the books, the study guides, the documentaries, it's all in the description of the video. Uh, next week, we will have Derek Gilbert on to take your questions. So that will be another, awesome. another fun week of questions. And uh, thank you so much for watching. God bless you and see you next Thursday. Take care.